Wow. All right, everyone. Thank you and hello. Uh, really excited for everyone to be tuning into today's conversation, cultivating fresh food, a successful business, and long-term sustainability for the Cayman Islands. Um, my name is Caroline Katsarubis. I am Freight Farms uh, Director of Marketing. And for those of you who are less familiar, our mission at Freight Farms is to build accessible modular vertical farming technology that really empowers anyone to grow food anywhere, regardless of where that might be geographically. And speaking of, we have a really great audience today tuning in from all over the world. I feel like there is a quite a tropical concentration. A um, lot of folks from the Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we've got all over the US, obviously, the Bahamas. Wow, welcome everyone. Nicole from Alberta, Canada. I'll be visiting um, in May. So super excited to check that that check check that out. Um, anyway, all right, less distracted by the people tuning in. Let's talk about the two lovely folks that we are going to be speaking to today. Um, our incredible customers from Primitive Greens in the Cayman Islands, and that is Cody Whitaker and Carrie Lawrence. Thank you both for taking some time to speak with us today. Today, we are going to be discussing everything from how this dream to start a hydroponic farming business came about, um, a brief introduction to the food landscape in the Cayman Islands, uh, the journey of starting Primitive Greens, and then all the things that went into building that business from trialing different crops and customers to securing future business partnerships. Um, there will be so much great information for folks uh, looking to learn more about this specific project in the Cayman Islands, and then especially a lot of great information for folks that are looking to start their own um, freight farming business or project in similar areas. Um, this whole conversation is going to be recorded, uh, and then we will email it to you in the next few days, along with all of the different resources that we're going to be sharing today. So don't worry if you miss anything. You will get the recording uh, shortly. And then if you have any questions, uh, we have a few folks from the Freight Farms team monitoring the Q&A um, section of the Zoom panel. So feel free to put any questions in there. And then at the end of today's conversation, we're going to be having a live question and answer session with Cody and Carrie. So if you have any questions specific to them, definitely uh, throw them in the Q&A panel. All right. Now that all of that is taken care of, let's kick things off. Um, Cody, Carrie, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, do you want to quickly introduce yourselves um, a little bit about your background and then give us a, a high level overview of Primitive Greens before we actually dive into the details? Good afternoon, Caroline. Uh, thank you for having us today. I know this one is a little overdue. Since yeah. we've been with you guys since 2020, but nonetheless, glad to be here. So to get started, my name is Cody Whitaker. I'm the co-founder and operator of Primitive Greens. And basically alongside me is Carrie Lawrence. I'll give him a chance to introduce himself. Um, hi, uh, Caroline. I'm Carrie Lawrence. Um, as Cody said, I'm in, have some involvement in uh, Primitive Greens. And we're very excited to, to do what we're doing here in the Cayman Islands, uh, accomplish this with uh, free farms. So to give you guys an overview of Primitive Greens, we basically started in 2020 and we're basically trying to take over some of the imports that are coming into the island. So Cayman Islands, as most Caribbean islands, most of our stuff is imported and we're just trying to provide a fresher product to everybody available on island. Fantastic. I think that's a perfect segue to start talking about um, what the general food landscape is like in the Cayman Islands. And I'm sure a lot of those listening that are in um, kind of similar geographic areas in the, the Caribbean or maybe even in other remote island areas uh, have, have um, kind of understand this, but for everyone else in the audience, can you give us an overview of what fresh food looks like on the island? Um, how you get your food, where does it come from? What are the prices that you're experiencing? 
Yeah, no problem. So basically, all most of our food is imported from the U.S. Um, we will have a few select stuff brought in from like Jamaica, Honduras, and places like that, but mostly we rely on imports for the U.S. So your leafy greens and your herbs, which we primarily focus on, is brought in from the U.S. So prices are quite high. Um, you have to include the the shipping costs. So getting lettuce from California all the way to Cayman, you have to send it on a ship, basically. So with that, you have a high fuel duty, high import costs, and then the quality of your greens isn't as fresh, which is basically what majority of the Caribbean islands face. And what, um, I, I think when people think of anywhere in the Caribbean, they automatically think of really nice weather, right? And you associate nice weather with maybe the ability to grow food. So can you talk about the other limitations other than climate that would actually be impacting um, the island's ability to grow their own food? Yeah, so Cayman's pretty small, I believe, are about 21 miles long. So arable land is at a premium and very, very scarce. So even to grow anything outside in the ground, you have to combat basically the salt spray is what we like to call it. We're basically surrounded by the ocean. So that's a problem. A lot of our soil is basically rock, limestone and things like that. So primarily what farmers here are growing in are, is basically red mold. So you can find that throughout the island, but to say grow crops, like the cold weather lettuces, it's almost impossible to do. And if you do grow it, uh, it tends to bolt very, very quickly. So mm. you won't have a very productive growing season with those types of lettuces. We're also in a hurricane belt. So every few years, we may get one or two hurricanes. Thankfully enough, we've been through every single hurricane since 2020, no problems, no issues, just the, the power would go out, but our, our plants have been fine. Did you, what would you, um tell the audience or just share maybe some stories about your experiences with um, the food supply chain personally? Like, did you, did the Cayman Islands feel anything uh, more acutely when it comes to uh, the food supply chain during COVID or any other supply chain disruption where it drastically impacts the cost or the quality of the crops available on the island? Yeah, so even a little bad weather outside of Cayman will stop ships from coming in. So say we have two days of bad weather, that's two days the ship can't actually come in and dock to offload food. So that's a longer time that you're waiting. But because of where we are and how we import our food, even the price of fuel, once fuel goes up, the price of our, our food will also go up dramatically. And it's almost in tandem. So we've seen with recently, I believe a, a month or two ago, head lettuce was about eight US dollars per head. Wow. So that was just because of the supply chain issues in the States and then the, the fuel issues. So anything that happens in the States, it affects us almost immediately. So right. that's another, another issue we face. And then even with that high cost of lettuce, it's not necessarily like you're getting a high quality product either if the, the actual time from when it's picked to when it gets to the Cayman Islands, the quality is considerably reduced, right? Yeah, so by the time it gets to Cayman, it's about maybe two to three weeks old. And that goes across the board for anything such as lettuces, herbs, strawberries, and things like that. So the closer it is to Miami, the quicker we'll get it. But even, even then certain things, um, they don't last as long on mm -hmm. the ship. So it takes about two to three days for a ship to leave Miami to get to, to Cayman. Then you have to offload it go through the customs process and things like that. So every single day you're losing nutritional value. And then a lot of wastage happens on the journey to Cayman. So a lot of the grocery stores or the restaurants do have to throw away a good bit of, of what they're buying. Okay. And so I think this is a perfect place to start introducing how you came about the idea of starting Primitive Greens. Um, so could you kind of take us through your thought process um, when you came up with the idea, why exactly did you choose food production as the thing to be focusing on after graduation? How did you and Carrie come together uh, to start this, this business? Yeah, so I believe it is summer of 2019. So I was graduating in basically December of 2019. It was kind of deciding what I wanted to do, whether I go into the traditional workforce, pursue my master's, or 
try something different. So we was speaking with Kerry during the summer months. And before I went back to school, he said, you know, if you have any ideas that you want to do, once you graduate, I'll basically back you. So I went through a few ideas, looked around at different issues that came and had and stumbled across farming. So I believe the average age of the farmer in Cayman as today is about 66. So there's not a lot of young people getting into farming. And even with the amount of farmers that we have, we only produce, as I said, 1% of our local food consumption. So I was looking for different solutions. You know, you can go the traditional greenhouse route, growing in the ground. And that wasn't something I was interested in. And I believe I came across an article somewhere describing freight farms, started looking into the system and basically pitched the idea to carry, you know, it took a little bit of time, you know, to get him on board, but once he came on board, we were, we were good to go. And then it kind of fell in at the right time because of COVID. So we first started looking at buying, our first farm was supposed to come in April of, I believe February of 2020, COVID happened around March. And once we saw that, you know, there was a real urgency on why this type of farming is needed in Cayman and other, other Caribbean islands basically because we're so dependent on everybody else. So once we saw the US, they were, they were cutting their orders of stuff that they were sending out to keep for their own people, it was, it was a no brainer for us then. And throughout the years from 2020 till, till now, every, every single week, the, basically the idea is, is cemented for us and, and this is the way we need to go. Harry, what did you think when Cody came to you with this idea? And, you know, he mentioned that you had said you'd back him in whatever kind of endeavor he was willing to, to maybe start. Um, why place your bet on, on this? Well, um, first of all, it was, it was very interesting. And, and obviously, um, farming is normally uh, losing business, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's very few farmers that make uh, money doing farming, okay? So when Cody came to me with the idea, we looked at it, and I looked at it in depth with Cody, and um, we went through the process of how can this work? What can we do to make it work? And it was basically a conversation to say, well, you know, we can go ahead and give it a try because the technology looks good. And the one thing that caught me was that um, the technology, and getting young people into farming is very hard, unless you literally grow up on a farm and, and that's what you want to do, then it, you kind of go in there and people that has grown up on a farm and being young, they don't generally want to do that, right? So with the technology, and I know that the technology is going to grow and what you can accomplish with it, it was very interesting to me to, um, to get involved with it. So we just hedged our bet and, and took, a, took a, a gamble on it. And here we are now. Do you, I, I'm just curious between the two of you, a, a lot of our customers end up being some sort of combination of um, different strengths. What would you say the two of you bring to the table um, for this business to be successful? So I handle the majority of the, the farming stuff. So ordering the seeds, planting out the stuff, looking for customers and things like that. Kerry handles the more, uh, logistical side of it. So organizing cranes, shipments, and then he also networks and talks to uh, various few stakeholders on the island, which saves me a ton of time. So I don't have to worry about that. So together, we're almost a, basically a perfect combination. So he'll handle all the, the heavy equipment side of things. And I'll just handle the operations. Great. Yeah, so, uh, and and I, I also deal with growing the business where I, I see that it, uh, we see that it needs to be uh, to be successful here and, and, and how to grow it and the steps forward. So we both put it in place together to, to figure out the, the right way forward so we can uh, accomplish our goals here on this island. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's a great place to start also talking about how you planned before the farm even got there and how did you develop your um, sales channels and your business plan? What was the vision? Like, yes, you decided the technology is the right fit for the Cayman Islands. What was the vision? Who are you going to be selling to? Obviously, you want to improve food security on the island. How exactly are you going to be doing that? 
Uh, so to improve food security, you basically have to go to those who are consuming it most, which is your basically your retail customer. So we basically started doing tests with various different supermarkets. Um, the problem is in Cayman, because we local farmers was only producing 1% of what uh, the island can sustain for certain types of things. But we went to the supermarket and said, hey, we can produce X amount. A lot of people didn't really believe us, basically because what they were used to was, you know, people, local farmers can't stay consistent. Uh, what happens if a hurricane comes through, you know, what advantages do they have buying from primitive greens instead of just continually importing stuff? So basically with that, we just had to bring everybody out and show them the technology so they can touch it and feel it. And once we started doing that, once we started becoming consistent, you know, week in, week out, then our business started to grow that way. Um, once customers go in the store, they they know our label, they'll buy the uh, lettuce in there and it's the best lettuce that they've ever, ever tasted. So our retention is very, very good. So they'll go back. I know certain people who go to the supermarket and if our lettuce is sold out, they won't buy any lettuce for that day and they'll come back the next day to see if there's anything in there. So business is really picking up on that side. And then there's also been a lot of interest with the restaurants as well because of how much we're producing. So same thing again, giving out tests, a few pounds here and there. And once they started to, you know, get confidence in what we were growing, I can pitch them different things. If I wanted to do, say, a trial of radishes or a trial of basil or things like that, they'll willingly take it, try it in their plate. So right now, those are some things we're also planning to expand in on too. A, a, a big thing um, that comes up here is the role that education plays in establishing your sales channels, as this is such a new novel way of growing. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about that. Like, What were your actual strategies around uh, getting people on board? Did you give them tours? Did you have marketing materials that explain the technology? How long did this whole process take? So with the restaurants, it was pretty straightforward. I'll go to the restaurants, maybe at a time they weren't too busy, give samples and just keep following up, keep following up, um, checking if the price was good, if how the, the lettuce stored in their fridge, because with different people, they have different fridges. So uh, the quality can vary a bit, um, how much they would like, if they want whole heads. And so the restaurants were fairly straightforward because they were buying in bulk. It's more so the grocery stores that took a little bit more time. So we had to test out the packaging that we wanted, our logo. Um, so we basically fell down or fell, fall into plastic packaging, um, which we're hoping to get rid of in the future. But it's basically similar to what you would see organic grow in. So it's basically five ounces of lettuce and that will stack well and it stores well in the fridge uh, for the supermarkets. And that's what they prefer. And people go in there and pick that up. I believe we sell out maybe if I drop it off Monday by Wednesday, it's all gone. So that's that's every single week. So people are people are happy with the product and the rest, uh, the supermarkets as well are happy with it. I mean, basically it, it was a, a learning process for us and also for the consumers on island. So we had to answer a lot of questions um, from the supermarkets, from our general consumers. So our thing was that we, we gave away a lot of the product. Uh, to begin with, to everybody that we can think about, uh, friends, family, supermarkets, restaurants, we basically gave it away so that we can get feedback on what can we do better to get the product out there and make people at that time taste the product, see if that this is something that they'd want to buy um, if they see it in the supermarket. So we did a lot of testing as a, to be able to get the product out there in the right manner. I think this is a really interesting because some people that are looking to get in, into freight farming often have the question, which comes first, the customer or the farm? Do I get the farm and then the customers will come or do I have to get the customers and then I'll get the farm? You two obviously went the route of you're getting the farm and you want to hone in on the growing process and then develop your customers. Would you change anything about that or do you feel like that was the right avenue for you to take? Um, and then I suppose, what advice would you give folks listening that are kind of on the fence between the two? On our side, it was the right avenue just because what we were growing was so different than what you could import. So that in itself was something different for the restaurants. And that's something that they needed to see and feel as well as the, the grocery stores. 
So if we tried to just go to them pitching an idea, I don't think it would have worked out as well. But because we had the physical stuff, they can come out and see it when they needed to. That really helped us in that in that process. And uh, the, the other part of that also is our planning and our long term goal and where we wanted to be at. Mm -hmm. So the process to get there, this was the right avenue, right? To be able to educate ourselves, educate the consumers to be able to get to the finish line of where we want to be at, where it is that we are supplying uh, the island with good, fresh, clean product that it actually needs and is healthier. Right. And I suppose the thing that folks should know before getting started is that when you're securing customers, you want to make sure that you're able to actually deliver on the promises that you're giving them. And if, and there is a learning curve. I think that's, that's important to stress. If you've never grown anything before, and this is a, a, a piece of technology, a very big piece of technology, um, there are some, some ups and downs. There's a big learning curve. So uh, I totally agree with the, the um, sentiment of wanting to get things right before and test before you actually, um, and give things away as well before you start charging people and, and keep that retention. Yes. Yeah, so I can basically tell you, we have a restaurant that's opening up, I believe in the next month or so, they're catering their whole menu based on what we're growing. So that's, awesome. that's strictly because we were giving stuff away. So a lot of the restaurants, they will change some of the stuff that they have in their menu based on what they can get locally, if they can get it consistently. So that's not a big issue for them. So let's talk about how um, after you established that you can grow, you got your, your testing under your belt, you gave out samples, you got those first few customers um, and those, those buyer agreements. How did you end up making the decision to start scaling the business? And can you kind of talk us through that whole process? So scaling, I was basically running out. So Basically, we, we had access to what the island was importing. So that was just a, a strict email that we can send to customs and they can tell you how much stuff was imported of various different types, whether romaine, leaf lettuces and things like that. So our goal in scaling was to get one container per type. So if we wanted one container, just romaine, one container, just green leaf lettuce, one container, just basil and things like that. So our goal has always been to scale, but then the more niche things like edible flowers and things like that, that would also take its own container. But so we were looking long-term of what we needed to do. And that was the only way we would be able to, to achieve that because we were running out of lettuce fairly quickly. So even though you do have, you can grow a lot of food, uh, a problem with the supermarket is they buy stuff with for variety. So it's not really a problem, it's just their, their sales, mo sales model. So they might want a hundred heads of romaine, 200 heads of green leaf, 300 heads of red leaf, but you're, you're limited to, to what you can grow in your space. So even though you can grow a lot of green romaine, once you start mixing things up and they need X amount, then it's a challenge basically to make, to make that happen in their quantities as well as supply to the restaurant. So ideally we'll have our newest container strictly just for fosters. So they buy everything in that container and then the other ones we'll have for the, the restaurants. It's a good problem to have, I would say. Yes. Um, all right, so I can see people asking how many farms that you have at the moment. So you have three farms. You also have three different freight farms models, which I can understand how that might um, not necessarily complicate things, but you can see the progression of the technology over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what you think of the the three different models and what have your experiences been so far? Yeah, so my biggest concern with the new, the oldest one, we have at LGM was basically the panels. So you have 256 individual panels. You have to take each single one of them and bring them to the front of the farm to get stuff out. So you couldn't really get in between the rows. And then the last two additions basically solved that problem. It's basically on a rack and pin and you can move things side to side. So the efficiency of getting things out is a lot quicker. And then the technology has also improved. The lights are way better. You get a better yield. And then the HVAC unit is a lot better as well. 
So with the older units, it was basically a refurbished shipping container that you guys had that you were outfitting with different parts. The newest container you guys purpose built for this purpose. And then inside is basically all freight farms, I believe. Everything mm -hmm. in there is freight farms equipment, so. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, I, I find it interesting that Fosters, I, I want you to talk a little bit about your relationship with Fosters and how you've gotten there. You've elaborated on it a little bit so far, um, but looking to pull out any pieces of advice for folks that are also looking to go into a grocery channel. Um, were there existing relationships there with Fosters? How long from like first conversation to now did it take to, to get things off the ground? Um, anything you can kind of fill in there would be super helpful. Yeah, so the Cayman landscape, I think is a little bit different. We're so small, uh, Carrie happens to know the Fosters. So that was an easy thing for us to get into is just proving the product to them. So I believe if you are in the States and you're looking to get into the grocery stores, you have to see what requirements they have there. So some might want you non-GMO certified, GAP certified, things, things like that, use certain packaging. So all of that would be dependent on your grocery store. But usually once you get that um, implemented, it's no big deal. Um, there's other hydroponic farms around the US that are able to get into grocery stores like that. So that shouldn't be an issue. But locally here, it was just proving the product to them. So once we were able to prove the product and people were buying it and it wasn't sitting on the shelves and it was lasting longer and it was more, I would say it's basically better than what they were importing, then everything just fell in line for us with that. Great. And with the technology, the technology makes it easy. You just have to put in the work. I'm seeing um, a few great questions come in. So I'm gonna try and work them into our conversation instead of necessarily just focusing them on the end, at the end. Um, did you feel like there was any competition with existing farmers on the island? Um, and is there room to collaborate? Obviously you mentioned that they only um, are able to produce around 1% of what the island consumes, uh, but curious about your relationship with them. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. our, our goal from the beginning was not to compete with the farmers that are on our land, which we really aren't, because the stuff that they're actually growing and producing um, are not stuff that we are growing, and we can supply what we are supplying, as in the lettuces and stuff like that, year round. And if they're going to grow lettuces, they can only probably grow it three months out of the year. So that's not really a cash crop for them. So we, we are not really competing with the farmers that are already here. Great. So are, are we just really going after the imported stuff because the farmers are producing what they're producing right now, which is a 1%. Um, most of the stuff are imported. So we are actually going after the importing goods more than going after the farmers. That was our goal to begin with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you, know, you grow different types of crops as well, like you mentioned in the beginning. Um, so can you talk to us about exactly what you're growing and then why you chose those varieties specifically? Yeah, so to begin, we were just testing a variety of different things, making people try it out to see what the demand was for it. Right now, we're primarily focused on leafy greens, primarily lettuces and salad mix, but I have grown red vein sorrel before. I was getting a good price for that, but that was niche. That was for one uh, restaurant. We've grown arugula basil, radishes. Um, biggest thing we have here is the electricity bill. So we're able to grow enough lettuce that it can compromise the electricity bill. Other things like edible flowers right now, we're not at that point, but that's why we have a plan to, to get solar installed. And once that comes online, then we can expand into other varieties consistently. I can only tell you how many solar questions I see popping up in the chat right now. Um, and I think we're going there next. Yes, I believe we are. So let's talk about the sustainability of the business, not even just from an environmental standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. Because you mentioned energy costs and whether it's cost prohibitive 
or, um, or not to be growing particular varieties of produce. So what has your experience been so far um, as it relates to energy costs? And, and obviously everywhere is experiencing increase in costs. Um, so what are the plans for the future as well? So just walk us through your, your journey here. So basically, once I was running up the numbers before we actually bought the first container, I knew it was going to be a little bit close and that we had to basically get solar renewable energy online in order for it to be extremely feasible. So there's only certain things, like I said, like lettuces that I can grow that I don't really have to worry about too much. But other things such as basil or kale, because you're getting you're still getting a lot for the week It's just the electricity bill is so high. So right now, I believe our kilowatt hour is probably like 35, 38 cents US per kilowatt hour. And if you're, and we're also in a hot climate. So the farm is burning quite a bit of, bit of energy to maintain the, the cool temperatures and things like that. So once we get renewables online, we'll be able to expand into other things. We bear in mind that we, we already knew that this was gonna be an issue um, when we laid our plans out. So we knew we were going to solar up. Um, so it's, it's as Cody says, it's it's kind of difficult to to really make a bunch of money doing farming using the electrical, the electricity here, the utilities. So we knew that it would be this process of getting there and getting the product out, have people come behind it, and then to move all their solar. And when when we end up and uh, getting the solar, then what would happen is we can then fix the price of what the goods are that we can supply. Because uh, as, as a good friend of mine said, the, the sun isn't going to cost you $1 more today than it will tomorrow, right? So we can basically fix the price and then we can grow more variety of stuff here on island and then we can uh, supply a variety uh, for a cheaper price and a healthier product. So talk to us about your plans to bring in solar. Like what, what stage of the process are you at right now? Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. OK, so what we've done is we, we've uh, pitched the idea to everybody that needs to be uh, pitched, which means government. We've pitched it to the Department of Environment. Um, we've pitched it to Offreg, who is the regulatory authority here for solar and electricity. Um, so it's basically in Offreg's hands right now. Um, to give us a permission to do the solar that we want to do to be able to support the farm. And we put in to do a three megawatt uh, solar farm. The reason for that is that we want to be able to grow into the farm and just for economics standpoint, uh, because setting up the infrastructure to put the solar in would not be any different if we did one megawatt or three megawatts. So it made more sense in economics to go ahead and put in for the full three megawatts because we'd have to put in the infrastructure anyway. Um, it's just more cost effective in that manner that we can then grow in to the, um, to the solar farm. So not, not only are you, oops, sorry, a lot of echo. Um, not only are you looking to run your own business off of solar, you're also looking to be helping lower the energy costs for all residents on the islands as you're trying to sell back that, uh, that, 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 that would be That would be until we grow in to the full farm. Okay. Right? So um, we'll be using, first off, we'll be using the first facility, we'll be using one megawatt, and we, we're proposing to sell the other two megawatts until we grow into it. Then uh, the farm will be using everything that's coming out from the solar panels. Um, our, Plans are to have the solar, have uh, the utility company here hooked up to us also, plus have a backup generator, backup batteries that we can um, sustain a hurricane. If there's a power outage, we can take care of everything. So we'll never be out of electricity in our, uh, our design. Great, thank you. Um, now, you know, more questions are coming in regarding how you plan to scale and if you are looking to 
be supplying even more locations on the Cayman Islands. So can you talk us through um, not only just what you're hoping to do with solar, but what you're hoping to do uh, as it relates to farm location placements and integrating the community more in your process? Uh, what does the future look like for you there? Yeah, so with that one, we didn't forget Cayman Brack and Little Cayman. We actually, our two first farms are what we plan to send over there. Um, that should be able to supply everything there that they need. But again, energy here is expensive. Energy over there is about maybe two times more expensive. So it's the energy side of it that's hindering us from, from moving forward and expanding at a rapid pace. So we've talked to a few, few people here that they were seeing if we can ship stuff over. Um, I'd rather just send them a farm. You know, that'll create some jobs over there help the local community over there as well, teach them how to grow their own food and they can be self-reliant on at least the leafy green side where they don't have to rely too heavily on stuff that we're getting here. So everything gets shipped straight to, to Cayman and then it goes from straight to Grand Cayman, then it goes to Cayman Rack and Little Cayman on, on ship. So what they're getting is uh, way older than than what we have. So they, they have to wait for us to to offload on the mainland. So we didn't forget them. And then once you're growing over there, they, they also have their own high school. So the educational component as well. So what, what we did, I'll weigh in on that for a little bit. Um, what we did is the, the whole plan that we put together was actually to integrate the schools. So we actually reached out to the college here, uh, the UCCI, and Cody uh, did a short course. And we're going to start in a short yeah. course there uh, this year. And the idea behind that was that we have young Caymanian kids that are coming out of the college that probably are interested in this kind of stuff. So we decided to offer a short course. That way we can teach how the technology, teach about the farm, and hopefully the one approval that we're waiting on from Alfred would come through. Because if we got the approval today, we can have the facility up and running within 14 months. Because everything is in place, we're literally just waiting on a yes from the regulator here, which is off, right? And uh, we can have the, the facility going in 14 months. So we figured if we teach a short course, then we can have the kids coming out of the college move straight into the farm. That would uh, eliminate us from looking for employees because we'll have those already trained up and ready to go in the facility at the same time. So that's the idea behind it. So we didn't really leave any stone unturned when it came to the planning and where we wanted to reach and how to get there. Yeah. And then that also goes into the educational component of anybody who was interested in our culture and, or anything like that, who's going away to school, that they actually have some place that they can come back and, and work in. So right now you only have really one place, which is DOE Department of Environment, where you could come back and do things like that. You do um, environmental sciences and, and marine biology and things like that. But this is something separate, strictly for farming and food security. So if you that's something you are interested in and you go away to the States or the UK and want to come back, you know, there's an avenue for you to go. So this is clearly a very well thought out business plan. You, I, I don't know how you feel about this question, but are you interested or have you ever considered franchising on Island? That's coming in from one of the attendees. I don't think we've even reached that stage yet, because I think what we need to do is actually get over the hurdle of um, the energy side, because that, that is our hurdle here. To, so to say that we'll be very profitable in having the farm and running the farm right now, it's, it's not so without the energy factor being taken care of. Um, and that goes for any other place that, that has the same energy factor that we have. That's your hurdle. Um, so we looked at this in a process that and, we, and that's why I said we didn't leave any stones unturned because we brainstormed over this uh, many nights, many days to figure out exactly where we need to be at and how to get there. And uh, we're almost there. As I said, one more approval and we will be there. We're hoping to get that in the upcoming months, uh, fingers crossed. Um, but the, the energy factor is, is, our, is our biggest issue that we have here. And I think that answers uh, many of the other questions that are coming in regarding profitability, where that energy is that um, that last hurdle for you, where yeah. the, the numbers will make sense once you yes. are able well, to implement what, what, what I think um, 
I think people need to understand is that when we went into this, we went into this to yeah, make a profit on it, but also uh, to solve the issue that we have. Okay, and the issue that we have here is food sustainability. Uh, how could we get there? How could we take care of our elderly? How could we take care of our cancer patients by getting them better food? How could we not use pesticides? How could we teach our young kids that are coming out of school that, that, that want to do farming and don't want to work in the sun and, and show them the technology that's out there that they could be able to do so? So these are all the questions that, that we have to answer ourselves and, and point us in the direction that we're going on. Mm hmm All right. I think that is where we come to the advice. There's been plenty of tidbits of advice throughout this entire conversation, but is there anything that you can think of specifically that you would pass on to, to folks listening that are looking to start their own project? Uh, first things first, get the business planning tool from Freight Farms. I know you guys update that every once in a while. So that would give you a clear understanding of what could be possible. Um, for us, mainly it was the electricity bill. So once you plug that in there, you kind of know what you can make, what you need to sell, what you can sell. And then to go out, you know, just go for it. Ask your, your market what they want. So I've seen some people, they don't sell directly to, to restaurants or supermarkets. They go to the farmer's market every every chance they, that they get and they're able to, to sell out their produce as well. So it's just dependent on the area that you're in and then what the demand is for various products. Mm -hmm. Carrie? Mm -hmm. Do you want to share any advice or is what Cody said? Well, is, yeah, what Cody says is, is, um, is this is spot on. I mean, the, the thing you have to do, as I said, is for us here, it was basically, as I said, the energy factor. And we knew that it was a, a long haul. Um, so you need to figure out if, you know, if it's the right fit for you and, and with your energy factor and make sure your profitability is straight and what you can sustain. Um, uh, we basically jumped in head first to be able to, to do this because of the, of the uh, scale that we want to do it at. But, uh, I'm behind it 100% and show is cool. We've put a lot of time and effort into this. So it's just to make sure you have all your uh, T's crossed and your I's dotted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let's get to questions because they're they're coming in and they're distracting me. Um, that may as well. <laughs> I know, they're, they pop up on your screen. Okay, I want to start with one in particular and then we can do kind of a rapid round with the easier ones. What type of community support have you been getting um, or reactions even? Because obviously this was a new form of agriculture on the island. Uh, what have people been saying? Who's been coming out of the woodwork to support you on this endeavor? Um, the support has been basically incredible. Um, everybody is behind us in the local community. They love that this is actually being done in Cayman and it's one of the few places in the Caribbean that's utilizing this type of technology. So they're really excited. Kids are also really excited. We did a tour about two months ago where I, I believe the group was maybe like 10 or 12. And they ate a whole panel of lettuce by themselves. So, you know, if you have any kids that's, that's to get them to eat greens is something very, very hard to do. So they're picking it up. They love the technology and they're telling their parents as well. So through that, we've opened a few opportunities. We'll be in a few magazines. And then also the agriculture department here has been fully behind us and they've been able to help us on the agricultural side with things that we need, whether it's permits, seeds, and things like that. And we'll also be doing um, their agriculture show as part of their booth. So that comes up February 22nd, I believe. So I'll be out there with a few samples talking to um, the local community about what we do. We'll also have a video playing behind me to give people more information. And then maybe there we'll, we'll see if we can schedule some tours as well. What about family and friends? What did they think? Also very, very supportive. You know, it's something extremely different. Um, we brought older people here and they've basically said that they'll, they never thought they'd see something like this in their, in their lifetime. So it's a really, the technology is just amazing to them. Um, younger kids, as I said, they, they get into it. So friends and family, they've, they've all been supported behind, behind this project. Great. Okay. 
rapid fire on a few. Supplies, seeds, nutrients, grow plugs. How are you dealing with that um, from a, a supply perspective? From a supply pers perspective, we buy in bulk. So we've become good friends with the people at Customs and our culture. So anything that we need, we don't really have too much issues getting it here. They know what it is already and we can declare it. So we haven't had that big of a hold up. And with that side, it was also an educational process. So I remember we ordered our first farm and they thought it was just a regular shipping container with farm equipment in it. So they couldn't differentiate. So that's something that if you are living in a Caribbean island or things like that, you have to you know, educate customs officers on what you're actually bringing in, um, let them go inside, see what it is, and just to get them, uh, give them a feel of things. So after we did that, we, we haven't had any issues shipping stuff over here. Great. Uh, all right, time it takes to actually operate the farms. And is it just you operating all three, Cody, or do you have other employees? So I basically use Carrie Sons. They're like my adopted brother. So they'll come in and help me seed, clean, and transplant things. So per farm, you're looking maybe at least 15 hours a week. Most of my time is actually spent delivering and doing business development, like uh, webinars and things like that. But the actual planting and stuff, because we are utilizing the clay seeds and I've been doing it for such a long time, I'm basically very quick. So it doesn't take me too long. So it's more the business development side that you'll spend more time on. Mm -hmm. Is it free labor from your sons, Carrie? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. You need, to, you need to know what you're worth. <laughs> some, some is free labor, but, but um, you know, it's for them too, it's, it's education. And, uh, and, and, and they, they support it also. And then they're behind it. So it, it has to give them something to keep that initiative going. Good. And they're also 13 and 15. Yes. So. Oh, that's a good age. Um, all right. How long does it take from seed to harvest for one of your heads of lettuce? Our head lettuce, we're doing about a four week head lettuce. So it's anywhere between six to seven weeks, depending on how, how big I want it. So, but right now we're focused on a solid mix. So it's around the six week mark. Great. Okay. And then um, a few people were asking, they noticed in the presentation that uh, you mentioned how you were going to have plans for some sort of warehouse or containment for all of the containers. What's the reasoning behind that? The, the reason that we did that is um, twofold. Um, number one is because we live in, in a hurricane belt, I uh, wanted to make sure that the containers are well protected. So we decided on building a facility, which is category five rated facility, warehouse facility. Secondly, it will give the, the operation a cleaner feel, which means you're not outdoor, you're inside a facility, all the packaging, everything will be done inside and it'll be a nicer, cleaner, less contaminated facility is what, what, what we're looking for. Great. Power outages. Obviously, with solar, we're going to have that problem taken care of. But do you currently have a generator? Yes. Backup generator. Okay. Do you find that you have to use it often? No, we're, we're pretty uh, good here with, with um, power outages. We don't really have much here. And when we do, we take care of it, obviously. Uh, and even that, I, I tested. So between 2020 and 2021, I've left the container off for two or three days and just, to see what just, just to see what would happen and turn it back on and the, the plants were fine. And granted though, we, we did, we also did a lot of testing with the product, right? Before we even gave it to anyone, friends, family, anyone, what we did is we left them in hot cars. We left them in the refrigerator as long as we can't see how long it lasted. Um, we left them on the countertops. So we did a lot of testing with the product also, the physical product prior to doing anything else with it. So personally, we, we did a lot of testing. That's great. Yeah, and people often do that with packaging as well. You're really testing the limits of yes. um, yeah. what the produce can do. Yes, what yeah. type of packaging, what it can go in, what it can't go in, and, and, and you test where, where we have it. That was also um, crucial for the type. So yes. we order everything from Johnny Seeds, and if you type romaine in Johnny Seeds, you have a whole list of romaine that you guys can go through and order. So it's basically narrowing down the type that works best for us and, and what we needed. 
Do you have best sellers um, from a crop perspective that was coming up as well? I believe the salad mix sells out the quickest just because people want the variety of lettuces that are in there, but the green leaf and the green romaine sell out just as, just as quickly. A lot of folks are actually asking about water and I uh, sometimes forget to mention that the farms are incredibly water efficient. You're typically, depending on what you're growing in your climate, you're only using about five gallons of water a day per farm. Do you find that that's an average where you are or does it, does it range depending on the climate or the time of year? It may be more or less than that. Um, the problem we have is because it's so hot, we are water positive. So I have to dump water maybe every day, day and a half. So water is, has never been an issue. Dehumidifier works great. And um, yeah, unfortunately we just have to dump out the excess water. It'll get all over the floor. So water is not a, not a big deal here. It's, it's a really interesting, um, uh, people don't even necessarily know what water positive means. You are actually yeah. producing more water, more water than you're using. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the plants are transpiring, the humidity, and most of the time um, our farmers are collecting the water through the de dehumidifier and putting it back into the tanks. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, it sounds like you're producing too much and you have to definitely offload that as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Are you following a particular maintenance schedule? Did freight farms provide that? Um, and how, how do you feel like the technical support has been from the company? Yeah, all the maintenance schedules are available in the community. Um, just your typical stuff, clean up, check the ACs and lights and things, just make sure everything's working. And because it is Wi-Fi enabled, if there is an issue, freight farms is able to look in at over Wi-Fi, run a few different tests. Um, because I do have a computer science background, that side of it I understand as well. So I just usually do all that stuff myself. That is That leads me to my uh, next question. Uh, someone is asking about automation of the facility. Um, and for those listening that might not know, we have a uh, fully compatible software automation system, Farmhand, that goes along with the greenery. Uh, that pretty much takes care of all of the watering, the lighting, the um, HVAC, all of the climate controls, and you can remotely see what's going on in your farm. Is that something that you utilize, Cody? Yeah, so I have notifications set up in my phone when things turn on or if something gets too high or too cold or too, too low. So that's something I monitor on an as-needed basis, but every morning I'll come in and check to make sure everything's okay, but the system itself has been good so far in alerting me of what the issues are, if there are any that occur. Great. Sorry, they're all, they're all coming in. They're all good questions. If we don't get to your questions, we'll try and uh, follow up with you after. Um, I know we've hit this before, but just as a direct comparison, how long does your lettuce last once purchased if kept in the refrigerator compared to imports? about two to three weeks. Um, once you put it in proper packaging, you should be fine. Even if you don't, usually the only thing we've seen is because it does get um, a bit dry in the fridge, it'll suck the moisture out of the lettuce. But once you put the, the lettuce back in water, they usually come back, come back to life because you are getting a living plant. So something that's a day or a couple hours old is always going to be a lot fresher than something that's been two, three weeks old. Mm -hmm. All right, this question is also about maintenance. Have you experienced anything that is broken inside the container? And then how have you worked with freight farms to replace those items? And how do you feel that that's went? Yeah, a few things that get broken in shipping. So I believe we had a vent that got hit on the side. Um, they sent out a replacement fan. It hasn't been anything too major that we couldn't just get something sent over and replace. So usually, Within the first years, if anything is going to break, that's when it's going to break. And then Freight Farms has the warranty on the unit that they'll send out any replacement parts that you need. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks are asking about government support. Uh, and if you know of or have personally, personally been able to uh, take advantage of any like government subsidies or loans or any other incentives um, in the Cayman Islands, or do you know of any others in the Caribbean islands? Well, we, we didn't ask for any 
support for that. And the reason why we didn't do it is um, we wanted to make it as simple as possible for government to approve the project uh, and to help us to approve the project. So we didn't go forward asking for land or asking for finance or anything like that. Um, we just want to make it very simple for the government to say, okay, everything is in place, go. And as I said, we're only waiting on one more approval. Our, our uh, minister, Sabrina Turner, has been excellent. We're getting us in front of the sitting government and, and walking us through the process uh, thus far. And then to touch on other Caribbean islands, you, most places do does have an agriculture department, so it would just be to reach out to them, tell them what you plan to do, uh, what can be done in terms of um, shipping costs, duties, uh, maybe electricity as well. I know some places in the, the U.S. you get subsidized electricity for farming. Uh, we don't get that here, unfortunately. So that's just something you'd have to look into with your local agriculture department. We've also seen that uh, some folks importing the technology don't actually have to pay any like import fees or taxes or duty fees on the technology coming into wherever you are because it's considered agricultural equipment. So if um, that is definitely something to consider and look into and also speaks to the educational side. Uh, you make sure that they know exactly what this is when you're bringing it in, in case it yeah. qualifies for any of those mm -hmm. exceptions. All right, we are running out of time. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with uh, that we haven't touched on so far? We're getting, we're getting great comments from everyone. You can probably see them can popping see up in the chat. Um, <laughs> someone also said, Hi, Cody. Um, I'm assuming you know this person. I no do not idea. see her name anymore. <laughs> um, anything Anything else you want to leave everyone with? I would just like to thank everybody for listening in. You know, this is a good boost of support for us for the week. Um, yeah. Glad everybody is, especially I saw people in from, I think, Dubai, Romania, and other places like that. So it's just a testament to how far um, freight farms have come and where it's planning to go. I believe you guys have over 500 farms all around the world. And, you know, in the community, we, we share insights on what we're doing and things like that. So if you guys are interested in getting a freight farm, I highly recommend. And then again, thank you guys for, for giving us, you know, the time today to, to speak on what we're doing here at Primitive Greens. Greatly thank appreciate you. it. Thank you both so much. Uh, this has been wildly helpful uh, for everyone tuning in live and then for everyone that's going to listen after. Um, I'm going to ask Amy to put the Primitive Greens website in the chat so everyone can follow along with their progress, um, follow on social media, just keep tabs on the great things that they are doing. Um, we also have, uh, in addition to these virtual events for everyone listening, we do have in-person events. Uh, we have a few coming up in the coming months. So if you'd like to come either visit the Freight Farms office and tour our farms in person or visit us as we are hosting events with our local freight farmers, um, check out our calendar and we hope to see you soon. Thank you both so much um, again and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. We'll, we'll talk to you all soon. You as well, Thank Caroline. You Thanks. Bye. Bye.